Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you in this place, and we ask right now that as we look at the life of Paul the Apostle, Saul of Tarshish, I pray, Lord, that as we wrap up the series about failure, we would realize that in this life, we will face many trials, many testing. We will fall, we will fail, we will disappoint, and that shame, that guilt can be with us, except, Lord, that you've called us to a life that's greater than that, something profound, something free, something beautiful. I pray, Lord, this morning that as we speak, as we look at the life of Paul, and especially towards the end of his life, I pray, Holy Spirit, that the lesson that he learned while in prison would be the lesson that we learn, maybe even our own prisons or whatever they would be. Holy Spirit, my prayer this morning that nobody in this room here would leave this morning wrapped with any shame or guilt or, or the history or the past failures that they have, that the enemy would stop whispering to them or they would stop listening to the voice of the enemy. Instead, Lord, that we would find a life that is made new in you, Lord Jesus. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. We're wrapping up a series that we started off a few weeks back on this idea of failure. And what's interesting about this series is, and the feedback that I've been getting is not a lot of people like to talk about failure. We like to avoid failure. We like to, not, we like to pretend it doesn't exist. And yet, within the church today, within the context of, of what we are in the church, there are so many people that are racked with failure that they don't know what to do with it. How do, we, how do we follow Jesus? How do we become a Christ follower? How do we become a disciple of Jesus? And whatever term you want to use, and yet we keep falling. We keep, we keep falling. We keep failing in this. Now let's just recap what we talked about last week. Throughout the series, what we've been trying to do is look at different individuals and see how they look at failure. And last week, what we looked at was Peter. And we said that Peter was a great example of somebody who failed and failed and failed. And I even said something kind of controversial last week, that Peter, as a leader, as, as, as a pastor, as a disciple, in his life, he didn't really do a great job. He, he just didn't. We, see, we saw that before you know, in the life of Jesus and the things he did. And again, Peter is a guy that he just wants to swing for the fences. And, and we all go, yes, we like that. But he struck out way more than he hit a home run. And even after, and we saw this, even after, uh, um, in the early church, after Jesus' ascension, Peter's still causing trouble in regards to the Jewish and Gentile uh, split within the church and, and his behavior within that. So much so that Paul has to kind of call him out on that. And remember, Acts chapter 15, the Council of Jerusalem, that's because of Peter, right? So Peter still struggles with what it means to be a Christ follower, and he still struggles with it. But we said last week that what failure does in our lives is it tests our why. When you fail at something, when you fall at something, what it's really going to ask, what you're really going to ask yourself is, why am I doing this? Why bother? Is this worth it anymore? Right? Failure tests our why. And what we saw with Peter is that Peter had his why tested a lot and yet seemed to still keep going forward. We look at this quote from Ken Bowen. It said this, Like many great leaders, Peter survived himself. With Jesus' guidance, Peter's fertile and active mind mature. Like, I love that phrase, Peter survived himself. He survived his failure, he survived his actions, he survived his misunderstanding of the gospel, of the church, of the Holy Spirit. He survived himself because of Jesus, of what Jesus saw within him. And we look at that uh, passage of scripture in John chapter 21, where Pete, uh, with Jesus in his resurrection appearance says to Peter, do you love me? Right, remember, and, and, and Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Agape love is like unconditional love. And Peter's response is, yes, Lord, I love you. I feel you love you, as in like a relational love. Right? And three times Jesus asked this question, and three times Peter says, yes, I love you. And the final thing Jesus says to Peter is, then Jesus told him, follow me. And I think above and beyond everything else that Peter did or didn't do on all his failures, this is the thing that he grasped a hold of most, is that Peter's failures were not final. Peter's problems were not final because he just, he just kept trying to follow Jesus imperfectly, and spectacularly in, in bad ways, but he just, he kept following after Jesus. So that's what we talked about last week. So this week we're going to wrap it up. We're going to take a look at the life of Paul in a moment, but I just want to kind of recap by saying a few things. First thing is, failure is universal. We have all experienced it and felt it. And I have said repeatedly through the series that the intention for me to teach on this is because as Christ followers, when we fall, when we, when we mess up, right, what do we do with it? How do we wrap our minds around it, right? This, this idea of perfection and, 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 and victory and triumphalism. But most of us are struggling with the things that just we struggle with. And we're like, how do I 
somehow grasp a hold of this and, and still move forward with, with, with Jesus. And I said to you in this series, I, I have felt as a pastor for 20 plus years that the thing that I encounter most is when people say to me is, how can God forgive me? How can God forgive me time and time again? How do I overcome this? How do I move past this? How do I grasp a hold? Because sometimes when you read the Bible, it can seem as if all these people get it. And you go, I don't get it. Uh, you see all the people kind of going, yeah, this is great. This is fantastic. And you, in your own life, you're like, I'm, I'm just still struggling. And as I said in the very first week of the series is one of the things that is most important about understanding our failures is the enemy, Right? I obviously, I don't know everybody in this room here, uh, but one of the things that Uptown Community Church we talk about is when we talk about the Bible, we talk about it as an entirety. And the Bible proposes a way of looking at the world that's maybe different than some of us may, may look at the world, but the, the Bible proposes that there is an unseen realm, what we call it the supernatural. As a matter of fact, in September, I'm going to be doing an entire series on the supernatural because I think we just need to have a reset on understanding how we grapple with it and all that kind of stuff. Anyways. Spoiler alert. So the idea is simply like the Bible tells us that, that there is an adversary, an accuser, the enemy, Satan, the devil, however you want to phrase this and however you want to image it, right? But the Bible tells us that individual, these individuals and his, the, those uh, that work with them are looking for any reason to pull us down, to hobble us, to, to make us so that we are ineffectual for the gospel. And the best way to do that is by reminding us of our past. It's the best way to do it. Because it's truthful, right? If I tell you about all the times that you have failed, I'm not telling you a lie. I'm just reminding you of what you are. And if you listen to that, then that's all you can think about, and you can't move forward. You can't progress. You can't do anything. And all the, all the promises the Bible talks about, all the things that Jesus asks of us, all the things the Spirit wants to give us, we're like, uh, I don't think so. That's for somebody else. And unintentionally, within church on Sunday morning, what we have done is we, you know, it's funny to me how churches say, well, we like, we don't, we, we, we like imperfect people or people who are not perfect or are messed up, but yet we present this entire perfection at the front there, right? You got lights, got cameras, everything's perfect, it's not perfect, but we're okay with people who are not being all together, but we're not going to show you that, right? Churches are meant to be places where people can heal and come with whatever it would be. And oftentimes on Sunday mornings, what can happen is you compare your insides to somebody else's outside. You're sitting there and you're going, you don't know what kind of week I've had. You even know what I did with this morning. You don't even know what I did last night. Right? And you look around people and maybe they're worshiping them with their hands raised, whatever it be. And they're like, oh, that person must get it. Because you're taking your inside and you're comparing it to somebody else's outside. And that's what failure does. Is failure keeps you locked in that, that frame of thinking so that you, you never get anything accomplished, you never do anything. So that's what we looked at last week. I'm sorry, that's, what we, that's kind of where we've been going with the series. I also have said, too, in this series that failing forward is an attempt at reframing our failures from shame and guilt to learning and growing. See, failures are absolutely important and vital to our growth. But if you don't look at them that way, if you don't understand them that way, then you will always just be ashamed of them and you'll always kind of push them aside. And the lessons you need to learn, and there are always lessons you need to learn, you may not be hearing them. You may not be listening to them. And failure isn't an if. It's a when. It's a when. You are all going to, at some point in time, um, like you will, you'll mess up. And when we talk about failure, we're not just talking about in your, in your academic career or your careers or relationships. These are part and parcel of life. We're talking about the failures of our, of, of, of our spirits, our, of the spiritual realm. If we don't reframe our failures, then they will reframe us. This is really important. If you are stuck in your past, if you are stuck in the things that have been done to you or you have done, if that's all you think about, nothing in the future is even that important to you anymore because you can't even get to the future, right? Because failure just, just, it just narrows down the focus of what we look at in the future. So that's the, really the intent of this series. So this morning, we're going to start off with a kind of a, a very odd way to introduce the topic we want to talk about. And we're going to look at what is going on in church today in Western culture. Um, there's a great uh, article that came out a couple years ago called The Life Expectancy of a Pastor by Carolyn Moore. And what Carolyn did was basically look at a lot of the data that's coming out about the church. There's a bit of a dirty secret right now within churches today. And the dirty secret is pastors are not really... 
continuing on. I'm gonna, I'm, I'll unpack this for you. Here's what she says. What sane person would want to deal with the competing demands, the constant fear of failure, and the chronic loss of sleep, not to mention the loss of weekends? And those are first world 21st century struggles. Basically, what she starts off the article saying is, who is crazy enough to want to be a pastor? Like, like, why would you even want to even enter into this field when it has become so absolutely toxic within churches today? And she cites a whole bunch of different uh, statistics. She says, 33% of pastors felt burned out within the first five years of ministry. 90% feel unqualified or poorly prepared for ministry. 90% work more than 50 hours a week. And this last part here, hundreds of pastors leave ministry monthly. Now, the reason there's an asterisk to it, because I found several studies, and one study cited about 300 pastors per month. This is from a denomination part. Another study said about 1,400 pastors a month. So I put the asterisk there because we're not quite sure exactly. And between denominations, it's a bit of a difference. So let's split the difference from the 250 to 1,500. And let's just say about 800 pastors leave ministry on a monthly basis. Now, just for a moment there, understand something. If 800 pastors are leaving ministries on a monthly basis, leaving pastoring or or however they want to view that uh, occupation within their lives, that leaves a huge gap within the churches. Some more uh, studies for you there. 85% 85% of seminary graduates entering the ministry leave within, the, uh, within five years. 85% of people who graduate seminary or Bible college to get into ministry within five years said no way. 90% of all pastors will not stay to retirement. And 50% of ministers drop out of ministry within the first five years. So, for example, I graduated with a class of students, and again, this is I, anecdotal because I haven't emailed everybody to ask them how they're doing. Hey, how are you doing? Are you in ministry? That's not the email you want to get. But I, I graduated with a uh, graduating class, about 104 people. And just anecdotally, just from you know, Facebook and, and, and social media, and again, this is not uh, scientific. Please hear me very clearly on that. But from what I can tell on Facebook, about 15 to 20 of us are still in ministry, I think. Uh, I'd say approximate. I could be a little off on that, but you know, it it kind of, exactly the statistics you're seeing there, it kind of falls through with that. It even got so bad that the New York Times picked up on this, uh, and an article back in 2010 said this, the findings have surfaced with ominous regularity over the last few years and with little notice. Members of the clergy now suffer from obesity, hypertension, and depression at rates higher than most Americans. In the last decade, their use of antidepressants has risen while their life expectancy has fallen. Many would change jobs if they could. So what's happening with the ministry right now, and because I'm a visual learner because of the way I teach, so I have to see it this way. So, for example, if you have a graduating class within a seminary or Bible college of 100 students, and you fast forward 30 years later to see how many of them have, have actually continued on, what you find is only 10 people will have retired or, or finished their career as a pastor. Now, this seems like an odd way to start the sermon this morning, uh, but I think it's kind of important. See, what's happened within Western Christianity, and again, at Uptown, we make that distinction between Christianity and we talk about Western Christianity. Western Christianity, Western churches have become so toxic, have become so high demanding, that what is taking place is pastors are not able to survive anymore. And there is an exodus of pastors. As a matter of fact, there's many mainline denominations today that are actually having a pastor oversee several different parishes because they can no longer uh, have pastors for each of those parishes. And of course, what's really happening with the, the, the most startling part of it is rural churches are, are, are dropping like flies all over the place. People are, are flocking to cities, not just for jobs, but also for, for faith and for spirituality. I came across one article where the person was saying, and this was the, I think this was either the Global Mail or CBC, I couldn't recall which one, I didn't put it up here, but basically they said that if churches in small communities shut down, what is the unifying force within the community? How do communities come together? What is the commonality where these communities come together? And churches in these communities have all sorts of services. You'll have like karate classes. You'll have AA groups. You'll have all these things. And they meet in church buildings. But if these buildings no longer exist, what is it that unifies these communities? And of course, you could say maybe the Optimist or the Lions Clubs. But these also, Kiwanis as well too. But these organizations are also dying out as well. Like it's, it's, it's across the board in Western Christianity that ministry is becoming more difficult. And not only has it become more difficult, that people are not making it past five years. So if I told you the attrition rate of the, your chosen career was 90%, how many of you say, yes, sign me up? That sounds fantastic. On all the school debt that I'm going to accumulate, and on top of all the school debt, I'm going to get paid half of what anybody with my education will get paid, and I'll get a little more vacation. I'll work 60 hours a week. That's for me. <laughs> 
That's the job that I want, right? Now, you can laugh, you can joke around with yourself, but it's actually kind of serious. Our denomination, the Christian Missionary Alliance in Canada, we're actually addressing this, and we're actually, some alarm bells are going off, because we look at the senior pastors in our denomination, and they're a certain age group, and we're not pushing enough young leaders through to kind of replace them. And this is a problem. Because obviously at some point in time in the future, a certain age group, the boomers are going to retire or, or they're going to step down. And the Gen Xers, which is my generation, we're close to the kind of part of like, okay, we want to have, uh, have a, a different generation come up. And behind us, there's not a lot of people coming up behind us within that. So the alliance and, and every denomination, just so you know, is talking about this, whether openly or behind closed doors. But there is a a lack of, of pastors. And don't even get me started about teaching pastors. This is even, this is even a, a greater problem because you can have maybe a pastor who helps out in different areas, but a teaching pastor or somebody who's a lead pastor who teaches on a regular basis, it's, it's even worse. Now, the reason I'm, I'm starting off this way is because when we took, look at ministry and we look at this idea of Christianity and being a pastor, what we are finding is it's hard to be a pastor today. But just so you know, it's always been hard to be a pastor. So one of the greatest pastors in history was a guy by the name of Paul the Apostle. Now, the video you saw there, it was uh, kind of clips together, was from a movie that came out last year about the Apostle Paul. And by the way, it's actually pretty good. Usually when Christian movies come out, you're like, oh, is Kirk camera going to show up or is, is, is what's going to happen here, right? And actually, this one was actually very well done, historically pretty accurate, right? And so you see Paul the Apostle and with his big bushy beard, and the last part of Paul's ministry was in prison, under a uh, Roman prison, awaiting a death sentence. And of course, Luke, as you saw in the middle clip there, visits Paul in prison, and this is where Paul writes many of his letters. These are called the prison epistles, and he writes many of them, like Romans, for example, was written from prison. And then the last part, again, was Paul's execution, where he was beheaded. We have a great deal of historical record, and, and we'll get to that. But what's interesting about Paul is that Paul endured both repetitive and relational failures. What would have destroyed the faith of many others only seemed to grow Paul's. Paul is a lesson in surviving failure. So we've talked about failure in two ways. We said there's our relational failures. And relational failures are relationships that have broken up or have fallen away or friendships, uh, marriages, um, uh, family, whatever it be. These are relational failures, and we feel these ones, right? Repetitive failures are things that we do consistently. And these, re- re- these repetitive failures are the ones that kind of hollow us out and make us feel like whenever we ask for forgiveness, if we feel like hypocrites, because we've done this so often or we've experienced this so often, right? What's interesting about Paul the Apostle is this guy actually experienced both of these, but yet when we look at Paul and we look at his ministry and look at his career, for some reason, Paul understood something that many people don't. And even as we're going to look through this, we're going to take a, look at, a brief look at Paul's life, is that he was able to survive and endure when many Christians did not. So what did Paul know that we need to know so that we can kind of apply this to our lives? Um, A great quote by Eugene Atkins is this. An enduring perseverance like Paul's does not happen accidentally, and it doesn't happen overnight, and it doesn't happen by sitting on the sidelines. An enduring perseverance comes by trials, by bearing fruit, by faithfulness, and by holding strong to the words and love of Jesus that won't allow our burdens to become too heavy to keep us from following him. And I think Eugene Atkins is absolutely correct. Right? When we think about Paul, the thing that comes to mind with Paul, and I've been sitting there and I've been thinking about Paul a lot this week, and uh, I've been thinking about his life. What's interesting about Paul is that when you look at Paul's life, in many ways, Paul is an absolute failure. In every Western understanding of Christianity or pastoring or ministry, Paul was a failure. And that's not what you think about when you think of Paul. You think of Paul the Apostle, you think of great and mighty and writes lots of words and is very smart and does great workers of miracles. But what is interesting about Paul, and we're going to look at this a little uh, briefly, Paul had this moment of, of, of just a great impact on the church, but yet he struggled in ways that you just you can't imagine. And the abandonment that he felt by people very close to him was part of his ministry. And yet, what we see with Paul, that we, that we really wrap our minds around with Paul, is his faithfulness, is his perseverance, is his ability to kind of continue on when most people wouldn't. So let's take a look at this real quick here, and let's just kind of make sure we understand that. Let me give you Paul's resume, and just 
be aware, a lot of words are going to appear on the screen. I always like to make sure that no one freaks out, but just want to kind of let it there. This is Paul's resume for what he had to endure. And we get a glimpse of this in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 27. Now look what Paul says. Okay, so he's trying to convey to the church in Corinth. Remember, Corinthians is kind of a wild church, right? They're like the Vegas church, right? Remember I've said to you before that Corinth had the largest temple to Aphrodite in the Roman Empire. Thus the reason why the Corinthians were very sensual. Because part of their culture was prostitution, right? And again, Corinth was a coastal town. And so they had lots of sailors and lots of goods coming in. And, and, and this was rampant in their culture. So when Paul is writing to Corinth, he says things like, hey, when you guys have communion, try not to have sex with each other. And uh, when you're having, uh, when, you, when you're, don't get drunk on wine either. And like he's saying these things to the church in Corinth. And you're like, what kind of church is this, right? But this is, this is the context. So at some point in time, Paul has to help them to understand what he's gone through. Now look what Paul says. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole, whole night and day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced dangers from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the scenes. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, endured many sleepless nights. I have been hungry, thirsty, and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. That's Paul's resume. This is when, like, you know, when, when a pastor retires and he kind of says, well, you know, what, what do you think about your ministry career? Well, let's see. I was beaten five times. Uh, I remember one time when I was in Ephesus, these robbers chased me and stole everything that I had. Oh, one time uh, my ship went down and I was swimming at sea and because of warm waters, there were sharks around. Uh, one time, uh, and I was like, wait, what? This is, this is your ministry? Right? Like, if we don't get a good parking spot, we're miffed. Right? Like, like, oh, church is at 10 o'clock in the morning. That's too early. Church is at 10.30. That's no good. Uh, church, it's, it's sunny out. I got to go golfing. It's a beach. I, 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 could you imagine if this was you? How many of you would stay a Christ follower if this is your experience of serving Jesus? How many of you, and, and, and of course, maybe not, not uh, many of you are pastors, but could you imagine if this it was your career, this was your resume as a pastor? Oh, my goodness. Like, could you imagine Paul's Instagram account? <laughs> right? Like, it's just like, hey, uh, you know, hey, look at my back. A picture of his back. It's just all bloody and brooded. And hey, look at my dinner. And this is like rats running around. And hey, look. Hey, hey selfie. And his face is all puffy from being beaten. He'd be like, I'm not going to follow this guy. And, and, and don't you kind of, because we're so success-oriented, don't you kind of go, Paul, there's got to be an easier way to be a pastor. Like, what are you doing wrong, buddy? Like, like, what have you not kind of wrapped your mind? Have you read, you know, John Maxwell's five uh, rules of influencing people? Have you, have, you, have you made good friends, Paul? Like, you're making good decisions here? Because I don't really think that this is what a successful Christ follower looks like. Triumphant. Paul, where's your big church? Paul, you know, there's a great Jewish worship band that just came out with a new album. And, uh, you know, Paul, like, you know, the, you, you got to get, like, like, this is how we look at church today. This is what Paul experienced. And I think to myself, as a pastor, who has experienced some ups and downs for sure, as all of us have, again, not to uh, minimize or exaggerate whatever we've experienced, but it's nothing near that. Five times a guy was, written, was whipped 39 times. And again, I don't want to gross you out, but a whipping with the Romans 39 times, your back looks like spaghetti after it. And Paul decides that that is what Christ calls him to. So what does Paul understand? What does Paul know that we don't? Let's talk about first Paul's repetitive failure because Paul experienced it. There's a passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. And again, he gives a glimpse and he says something kind of interesting. He says, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. And you're like, again, your imagination kind of goes wild with this statement. Like, can you just see Paul walking around? There's this guy in this red suit, the demon, like a pitchfork. Ha, 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 Paul, and kind of sticking Paul with a pitchfork. That's, that's of course, my 
juvenile mind. Uh, but what's interesting is the next verse, because Paul says this. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Now, why this is interesting is whatever this, this, this thing that Paul is suffering from or, or, or wrestling with, the Bible tells us that grace is sufficient, which means that Paul needs to ask for forgiveness. Paul needs to come to the Lord for something because graces need to apply there. So whatever Paul is wrestling with, it's wrestling on a, on a repetitive basis. We also see this again in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, as I have said before, and again, forgive me for repeating myself, it's one of my favorite chapters about Paul because this is the chapter that really humanizes Paul. Remember what Paul says, right? Why do I do what I don't want to do? Right? Like, 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 if you've ever gone on a diet or exercise program or try to study better or work harder, right? The question we always ask ourselves is, why do I do what I don't want to do? Right? right? Like, why do I do what I don't want to do? I want to do good, but I don't do good. And just so you know, only a person who wrestles with something can write this. Paul's not saying, why do you do what you don't want to do? Right? And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Whoever's writing that is, is deeply understands repetitive failure. He deeply understands the sin that is living within him. But again, the person that's writing this is Paul the Apostle. The greatest writer in the New Testament, the greatest apostle, the greatest pastor in history, I can argue, and he's writing this. Why do I do what I don't want to do? And we can all kind of go, yeah. All the other stuff you write, Paul, I, sometimes I don't get, but this, yeah, this is my spirit animal right here. This is, this is something I understand. And look what he says in verse 21, 24. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I am inevitably do what is wrong. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? I, I look at this, and I read this, and I have to pause, and I think to myself, this guy, Paul the Apostle, he really understands the brokenness of humanity. And not the brokenness of humanity as in far away, but the, his own brokenness, his own failings. He's, he's wrestling with it. And so Paul says, like, why do I do what I don't want to do? And I think to myself, why do I do what I don't want to do? Why do I behave the way I don't want to do? Why? And we all can answer is because we are sinful. But not only did Paul have uh, repetitive failure, but he had a relational failure. In Acts chapter 13, verse 3, we have this little, this little moment. And you got to remember this because this, this guy, John Mark, or Mark's going to pop up a couple different times. Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the port of Perga. And by the way, Dr. Zeus did not write this. It's just, uh, that's the way it goes. There, John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. It just, it's just one verse. But what is so interesting about this is that Paul is going off on a missionary journey. And this guy, John Mark, now we believe it's the same Mark who wrote the gospel of Mark. But remember, Mark didn't write his gospel. Mark was Peter's disciple, right? Peter dictated to Mark and Mark wrote it down. And so Mark, we we believe it's this same Mark. So this individual, whoever they are, has a, a good sense of Jesus. We don't know if they were eyewitnesses of Jesus. We perhaps suspect they might have been, but we're not 100% sure. But whoever this guy is, he has enough understanding about the church and of who Paul is, who Peter is. And they go off on the missionary journey, and this guy decides, you know what? No, it's not for me. And Paul's like, what do you mean? Like, we're, we're here now. Let's share the gospel. He's like, no, no, I, I, I want to go back home. Right? So this guy, this guy abandons Paul. Now, watch this. In Acts chapter 15... This is after the Council of Jerusalem, and this is after all this great stuff has happened where James, the brother of Jesus, who I believe is the true leader of the church, stands up and says, okay, Gentiles, we're not going to circumcise you. And all the Gentiles are like, Whew, okay, good. But here, here's how you understand, you know, understanding of the Jewish way of, uh, of learning. And so after this, Paul and Barnabas. Now, just want to say something about Barnabas. Now, we've talked about this before at UCC, but if you were not here for this, Paul, when he was first converted, was hated by everybody. Right, so Paul goes to the Damascus Road, has a vision of Jesus, right, and, and, and he gets his eyes healed, he's blind, he gets his eyes healed, and he goes out and starts preaching. 
And we know this happened for about two years, but remember the Bible tells us. He goes out preaching, but nobody wants to listen to him because they think he's a spy. And the people he formerly worked for want to kill him now because he's betrayed them. So Paul is hated by everybody. It got so bad that after two years, the church goes, okay, we don't know if this guy's real or not, but it's been two years now, but there's no way anybody wants him to talk to them. So let's send him back home because we don't know what to do with him. So they send Paul back to Tarshish. He sits there for 13 years. 13 years, there's not a peep from Paul. Now, what do you do in 13 years? You're rejected by everybody. You come home, and we believe his family was there, and he comes home a failure. He leaves being a persecutor of the church, being high in the Pharisees, having an occupation. He comes back, nothing. He just absolutely failed in his life. And for 13 years, he lives there until one day a guy named Barnabas. Now, remember, Barnabas wasn't his real name. Right? He was a Levite. He, he, he's a Levite from Greece. Barnabas means Bar, B-A-R, is son of, Nabas is encouragement. Barnabas, his nickname in the church because of who he was, he was, a, he was an encourager. And Barnabas was being sent from Jerusalem to Antioch, which is right above Jerusalem, because they hear people there are talking about Jesus. So we should send somebody to Antioch. So they decide Barnabas should go. The Holy Spirit says to Barnabas, go get Paul. So Barnabas goes out of his way to Tarshish, says to Paul, hey, Paul, you don't know me, but the Holy Spirit told me to come get you, and I'm going to train you to be a pastor in Antioch. Now, after 13 years, would you go? I wouldn't. You're like, if you would have come two years ago or 10 years ago, maybe. But now I've, I've got my life back together again. I'm, 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 I'm making sales. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a tent maker. I, 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 have, I have a life now. I don't want to leave it now just for this again. But somehow Barnabas convinces Paul, and Paul, Barnabas takes Paul to Antioch, and there for several years, disciples Paul, and Paul and Barnabas start the church in Antioch. Now, the reason I tell you this, Barnabas has a very close place to Paul's heart. Barnabas was the reason why Paul returned back to ministry. It was only because of Barnabas and the Holy Spirit tapping Barnabas in on his shoulder and saying, go get Paul, that Paul actually gets back into ministry. Now, look at Acts chapter 15. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the, Lord, the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. Oh, remember this guy? Back in chapter 13, who left Paul? But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted him in Pamphylia and had not continued with them on their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Barnabas is Paul's guy. Barnabas is the guy that mentored Paul. Barnabas was the guy that took Paul from obscurity back into uh, communion of faith. And yet in this moment in time, Paul says to Barnabas, Barnabas, John Mark's not a missionary. I've tried this already with him. It didn't work out. And Barnabas is like, no, I'm going to do this. They disagree so sharply that they go two different ways. And we don't know, just so you know, this passage of scripture of Barnabas is the last time that we hear about Barnabas in the early church. He, he still existed, but we don't know what happened to him, but we don't know. And we also don't know if Paul and Barnabas ever reconciled. This is the guy that brought Paul back into ministry. Talk about abandonment at that level. But it even gets worse than that. If you read 2 Timothy, now 2 Timothy is a very interesting letter. It's Paul's last letter before he dies. Paul is in prison. You saw at the beginning of the clip there. He's in a Roman prison, and he's just being await, he's wait, awaiting death from the emperor Nero. And in this letter, Paul writes to, second, uh, writes, writes to his, ment his, his person that he's mentoring, his young pastor named Timothy. And this letter, if you read through it, the language and the, the sentiment from Paul, Paul's a broken man. Now, look what he says here in, in 2 Timothy. As you know, everyone from the province of Asia has deserted me. Now, I, I don't know uh, what that's like. I, I don't think I could ever say that, you know, everyone from the United States has abandoned me, which uh, may not be a bad thing. Um, you know, everyone from Australia has abandoned me. Everyone from Europe just hates me. I, like, how does an entire province hate a guy? But yet Paul says to Timothy, Everyone from the province of Asia has deserted me, even uh, Phylus and Hermonides. I don't know if I'm saying that right. 
but these two individuals who must have been close to Paul. Now look at verses 4, 9, and 10. Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, and Titus has gone to Dalmatia. These are people that have worked with Paul, and they've all abandoned him. In that passage of scripture, in the, in the video clip there, I don't know if you saw this, but Luke says that Paul stood before the emperor or, or the Roman authorities, and he was by himself. And if you, if you caught in the clip there, Luke says, had I known what would happen, I would never have left your side. But Paul was abandoned by everybody. Paul the apostle, the planter of more churches in the early church than anybody else, the worker of miracles, the writer of more letters in the New Testament. And in this prison, he's writing Timothy. And you can just see the tears rolling down his face. Everybody's abandoned him. Look at this again in verse 14 and 16. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, but the Lord will judge him for what he has done. But be careful, for he has fought against everything we have said. The first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. May it not be counted against them. Have you had a friend stab you in the back? You ever had somebody you work with, a coworker, just totally kind of undercut you? You ever had a family member do this? How about somebody that's close to you? Have you had somebody close to you abandon you? And the answer probably, if you're a human being in this room, is yes. Paul is in prison awaiting death. And the only person that visits him is Luke. We don't know if Timothy made it back to Paul's side before Paul's execution. Paul, re- Paul struggled with repetitive failure. We know this. But Paul also struggled with relational failure. Like, if these many people left you in your ministry, how could you go on? How, how could you wrap your mind around continuing forward in the work that Jesus called you to when so many people abandoned you? Like, like, Paul's never going to get called to the preacher circuit. He's never going to have a television ministry. He's never going to preach in many big uh, things. He speaks the truth and whatever that is, and everyone just decides, no, no, and they leave him. I, I, I read this, and I actually had to kind of reread it because it was so, so heartbreaking that this guy who did more for the church than any of the disciples any of the apostles, he did more for Christianity than any human being on the planet. At the end of his life, is writing from a, a Roman prison, and everyone has left him. But yet he says to Timothy, well, I'm not going to tell you what he says to Timothy. I'll get to that in a second. This guy, at the end of his life, towards the end of his career, is all by himself. I, I had to stop there, and I... Um, I don't get emotional often, but I sat there and I thought to myself, oh, dear goodness, how can this be that Paul the Apostle is by himself, beaten, starving, maybe disease-ridden, we don't know, infections, and he's calling out and he's just, he's just giving a report and saying, everybody that I trusted, everybody that I cared for, they're all gone. If you saw at the very beginning, I call this sermon Mindful Failing. I came across an individual who, um, Leticia Gasca, um, she has a TED Talk. When you start researching failure, and we start researching people who talk about failure, you come up with some pretty interesting things. Leticia was an entrepreneur, and uh, she wanted to um, help these indigenous women in Mexico to uh, make purses and, and make a business of it. And she thought these purses were great quality and people loved it. So I'm going to help these women. And there was a little village who made these purses. And she was going to take them and sell them on the world market and, 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 the, and the global market and help them out. Well, after a couple of years, they ran out of money and it failed. And she had to go back to the village and tell these women, I don't, I don't have anything for you. I'm so sorry. And so she let, dealt with this failure. And she lived with this failure for many, many years. And she says in her TED Talk, I felt so guilty that I decided to hide this failure from my conversations and my resume for years. I didn't know other failed entrepreneurs, and I thought I was the only loser in the world. And just so you know, I think we can all feel like that. When we fail in our, in our faith, when we fail in what God wants for us, we feel like we're the only ones. Everybody else has got it straight, but we're the only ones who can't do it. She goes on to say this, 
But what does it mean to fail mindfully? It means being aware of the impact of the consequences of the failure, being aware of the lessons learned, and being aware that the responsibility to share those learnings with the world. She goes on to say this, being more serious, that night I realized that A, I wasn't the only loser in the world, and B, we all have hidden failures. Please tell me if this is not true. That night was like an exorcism for me. I realized that sharing your failures makes you stronger, not weaker. And being open to vulnerability helped me to connect with others in a deeper, more meaningful way and embrace life lessons I wouldn't have learned previously. So what she's saying is if we fail mindfully, being aware of the impact, and not to minimize a failure, but to feel it and understand, okay, what can I learn from it? But then not only experience it, but then to share it with other people. To say, hey, and, and in that moment of sharing your, your failings with somebody else, it creates a vulnerability, but also creates an intimacy. I've mentioned before in the past that I've had the opportunity to help with 12-step uh, programs and 12-step groups, people with addictions, people who have struggled with different things, and a wide variety. Not just uh, uh, substances, but in other ways as well, too. But what I found most profound about these groups was, is these people sit and share stories about up, uh, moments that they've almost failed, or perhaps moments they did fail. And rather than being judged by the group, they all turn and look at each other and go, yeah, I've experienced that as well. You know, we have this thing in the church called testimonies. And testimonies are usually things of, 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 of conquering, of victory. What if we had churches, uh, a moment in church where we say, hey, who wants to share about their failures today, uh, this week? Who wants to share how they just absolutely messed up? Who, who, who wants to share about the time that they let Jesus down? Who's the first? Who's the first person? And we're all like, oh, I want to be there, but I don't want to say anything. I want to hear other people. I don't want to share anything. And what she's saying in her TED Talk, what I think was so important that I wish people in the church would understand, our failures will bond us together. And our failures are, 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 are going to remove this invincibility that we think of ourselves or this facade of perfection that we've created around ourselves and just say, you know what? I love Jesus and I have really have a hard time serving him. And I don't know how to reconcile those two. You as well, me too. And all of a sudden these stories of people struggling with trying to figure out what it looks like. Let me close with kind of giving you Paul's secret to failure, surviving failure. The first thing I think about with Paul is, remember Romans chapter 7? Why do I do what I don't want to do? Well, the great thing about Romans chapter 7 is follow with Romans chapter 8 verse 1. And Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says this. So now there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, the word condemn that Paul uses there is interesting. It's a judicial word. It's a word of you stand before a judge and they find you guilty or innocent. And what Paul says is that our failures, our sins, do not condemn us. In other words, they don't remove us from Jesus' presence. Our failures don't condemn us. They teach us. Failures aren't final. They have no power to remove us from Jesus. See, what Paul understood about failure, which we have forgotten, is our failures do not define our relationship with God. And if they do, then your failures become greater than who God is. When people say to me, can God forgive me? What they're really saying is, is God bigger than my sin? And my response tends to be is, your God is very small. Your God seems very petty. Your God seems like, well, I don't know what he seems like, but it's not really the God of the Bible. See, my, my, my God is a God of infinite love and, 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 and justice and grace and mercy. And he picks me up and, and I see these people in the Bible who God used who fail all the time. And yet he seems, seems to love them. That's the God that I see. But the God that you are describing to me looks like, well, it kind of looks like you actually. That you've you looked in the mirror and described, well, this must be what God looks like. And so what I think what Paul understood better than anybody is that his failures did not condemn him. They taught him. They humbled him. Oh, yeah, they humbled him. And he, ever was ne he was never afraid to share it. You know how I know this? Look at the next one. In Philippians, uh, Philippians 3, verse 12 to 14, says this, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or I've already reached perfection, but I press on and possess perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Forgetting forward, forgetting forward. Hmm. Failure tempts us with distraction. When you fail, it's, what do you think to yourself? It's over. It's over. I can't, I can't, oh no, this, ah. What did Paul understand about failure? And do you know why I love what Paul says about forgetting the past? 
He's the guy that killed Christians. He's the guy that dragged people from their homes and beat them. But every time he says, you know what? I don't think about that anymore. What I think about is what Jesus has grabbed hold of me. My failures are not final. My past is not my future. Forgetting, moving forward. What else does Paul teach us? Well, I think what Paul teaches us as well, too, is he, Paul never denied his past. And many times when he writes to the churches, he would say to them, I am the least of the apostles. I just came on the scene X amount of years ago. These 11 apostles, they were there from the beginning. I only saw Jesus in a vision. They saw Jesus in the flesh. Paul, time and time again, told people how unworthy he was to be who he was. But that didn't seem to stop him. See, sometimes we use unworthiness as an excuse. Well, I'm not worthy, so I'm, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. Hey, you know, I don't want to share my gospel or tell you at, church, at, at work or at school I'm a Christian because I'm not good enough. Oh, I see. So you think this is what Jesus called you to. Remember the Samaritan when we looked at a couple of weeks ago? What was your testimony to the people in the village? Come meet the man who told me everything I've ever done. It's kind of a weird testimony. Don't you want to say something better than that? Hey, come meet the guy that can read my mind. Come, come meet the guy that knows my thoughts. That's cooler. But it said her testimony to people was, come meet the guy that knew everything about me. And I think if she would go back and say it, she'd say, come meet the man who knows everything about me. Come meet God who knows everything about me and still loves me. Paul never denied his past. He never once denied what he did or who he was. But that didn't stop him from what God wanted to do in him. And though Paul felt the sting of relational failure, he also left room for reconciliation relationship. 2 Timothy 4.11. Remember that guy, John Mark? Look what he says. Only Luke is with me. Remember, he's in prison here. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. I think this is, as close as way, this is as close as Paul will ever get to saying, you know what, you know that moron Mark? You know that, 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 that guy that left me? That I got, in the, I got in that argument with my mentor Barnabas? Maybe send him back. Let's see if we can have a conversation. Maybe we can ask him for forgiveness. In 1 Corinthians 9, 6, or is it only Barnabas and I who have worked to support ourselves? We don't know if Paul ever reconciled, but Paul never spoke badly of Barnabas. As a matter of fact, Paul used Barnabas as, again, another example of somebody who's doing what they're supposed to, authentic. Paul never let his relational fallout stop him. He didn't degrade Barnabas. He didn't say, hey, remember Barnabas? He's the guy that sided with John Mark. Remember John Mark, that little rat fink who left me? I'm just being honest here. And rat fink is in, in the Greek, it, it just means bad. I don't know. No. Um, but I love the fact that in, in Corinthians, when Paul is talking to the church in Corinth, he's upholding Barnabas as an example of somebody who's following Jesus. 2 Peter 3.15. Remember, this is Peter. Remember Peter? Paul got in Peter's face. I, I love the fact the Bible doesn't hold any punches when it talks about disagreements or, or the things that no one else wants to talk about. Remember, Paul says, I got in Peter's face. And I told him you're being a hypocrite and you're leading other people through hypocrisy because of your behavior with the Jews and the Gentiles. Look how Peter talks about Paul in 2 Peter 3.15. And remember our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with whom the wisdom God gave him. Peter and Paul reconciled even though they disagreed. And Peter in his humility, this is what I said to you, Peter finally got it. Peter humbled himself and knew that Paul was right. Dear goodness, what would the church look like if we would humble ourselves and not worry about whether we were right or not, but just serve together? Rather than having to have our own opinion, our own way of doing things, the only way of doing things. Paul felt relational failures, but he also left the door open for that reconciliation that could happen as well too. In Tacitus, Tacitus is an early church historian, not, sorry, let me rephrase that. Tacitus is an early historian, Roman historian. He did not like Christians. The reason we know this is because he described them. So when Tacitus talks about Christians, you know it's mostly truthful because he doesn't like them. As a matter of fact, we get a lot, a lot from Tacitus. And this is what Tacitus says about the Emperor Nero. Um, 
And so to get rid of this rumor, Nero set up, i.e. falsely accused, as a culprit and punished him with the utmost refinements of cruelty, a class hated for their abominations who are commonly called Christians. Besides being put to death, they were made to serve as objects of amusement. They were clothed in the hides of beasts and torn to death by dogs. They were crucified, others set on fire to serve to illuminate the night when daylight failed. The reason I add this is because it was Nero in one hit, in the Neronian persecution in 60 AD, killed Peter, killed Paul, and killed many of the disciples. And because of his persecution of the Roman church, these Christians, which you saw at the very end of the video there, the end of the video there shows Paul, but then shows him in the afterlife, seeing those who've come before him. The people you saw in the crowd there, you didn't know this, but these are people who died in the movie. And I love that last scene. Oh, man, I'm getting shivers just thinking about it. Off in the distance is the rabbi. It's Jesus. Whatever Paul understood about his life, that was the moment he looked forward to the most. Philippians 3, 7 to 9. This is the foundation of Paul's life. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. Do you know why Paul kept going forward in his life? Every success and every failure was garbage. See, we like to think of failures as garbage because we don't like to think about them at all. But Paul thought his victories were garbage as well too. Paul said that the only thing that mattered to him was Jesus. That's it. And how does a man living in a prison cell, being abandoned by everybody he trusted, who was close to him that he ministered to, how does this individual continue forward? How does a guy who struggles with his own personal sin, the own personal things that he has to deal with, how does he go forward? Because he looks at his life and everything in his life is garbage next to knowing Jesus. Paul understood what we have forgotten. Either Jesus is worth everything or he becomes worth nothing. Either Jesus is our Savior and our Lord, and he takes center place in our lives, or we begin to negotiate with him. We begin to kind of push him off to the sides. We begin to push him off to the, 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 the sides of our lives so we don't have to think about him so much. And what I think Paul understood more than anybody else is that if Jesus is the center, if Jesus is my Savior, if Jesus is everything, then everything that I endure, every failure, every success, every time I was beaten, every time that I got to mentor a disciple, whatever I experienced, the good and the bad, it's unimportant to me. What is of vital importance to me, what is at the very center of who and what I am, is Jesus. Jesus was worth everything to Paul. He was worth everything. When he's being beaten, when he's being led to be beheaded, I don't know about you, but I might have some second guesses about my life choices at that point in time. As they're placing his head upon the block of wood, I might have some second guesses. Like, how did I end up here? I'm a nice guy. I, I, I try to help people. How is it my head's about to leave my shoulders? And I think Paul, as he's walking to his death, as he sees the crowds of Roman and the executioner, I think his eyes were closed and he was thinking about the rabbi he met on the road to Damascus. And I think that that's really what kept him going through everything. Every time he was, he was in a place where you just can't imagine Paul the apostle, every time someone abandoned him, every time somebody left him, every time someone walked away from him, it's Jesus. Every time he was attacked by people within the church, no pastor has ever had that happen before. It's Jesus. Every time his mentor or whoever else in his life left, it's Jesus. Either Jesus is worth everything or he becomes worth nothing. Let's pray. So your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. We do this every week. I'm not going to freak you out. I'm not going to make you do anything. I just want you to take a moment to reflect, to think, to ponder. It's a heavy sermon this morning, I know. Paul the Apostle, the greatest Christ follower, the greatest pastor in history, 
was an utter and absolute failure in Western standards. Abandoned, alone, betrayed, beaten. And yet, at the end of his life, it was always Jesus. It's not about your failures. It's not about your successes. It's not about the entirety of your life except what it should be about is Jesus. And if you don't have that as your focus, if that's not your target, if that's not your North Star that you navigate by, then it is so easy to get distracted and fall away. Either Jesus is worth everything or he becomes worth nothing. I have been thinking about this this entire week. I have been thinking about this so much. As a pastor over 20 years, in the last five years, especially with UCC, my resolve has been tested. 2018 almost destroyed me. I'm still recovering from it. I'm just saying that to be honest with you. That I, as a pastor, as your pastor, I still have to wrestle with what it is to be a Christ follower in the midst of this world we live in. And I tell you that to be vulnerable and to show you that whether it's me or it's you or anybody else or whoever it would be, whatever age and stage you're in, it's, it's Jesus. It has to be Jesus. If it's not Jesus, then I don't know what I'm doing. If it's not Jesus, then I don't know what I'm doing. Jesus has to be worth everything or he becomes worth nothing. That's my battle cry right now. He's worth everything. He's worth every defeat. He's worth every success. He's worth every failure. He's, every, he's worth every relational abandonment. He's worth every internal failure that I, I, I myself struggle with. He is worth everything. Because at some point in time, I will take my last breath. And I will stand before him. And all I want to hear from him is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. That's all I want to hear. That's all I want to think about. That's all I want to possess my life about. And that I will give to whatever I have to him. And if I'm not giving enough, I will give more. It's got to be about Jesus. He has to be worth everything or he becomes worth nothing. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for everybody gathered here. Lord, I, Lord, I first pray for those here who are struggling with their failures. Who have lived so long with their failures to find their relationship with you that they can't even think about the good stuff that you have for them, the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit and, and a life more abundantly, all these things we talk about, all they think about is what they've done or what has been done to them. And I pray, Holy Spirit, this morning, you would break that chains that bind them in Jesus' name. That, Lord, that each person here would realize how they are loved by you. And your love is infinite. We are finite, God, and the sins, the things that we do are finite. But you are infinite. You transcend and I pray, God, that you would transform us. Holy Spirit, we invite you in. We ask that you would just examine us. And Lord, for those things in our past, maybe even in our present, maybe even in our very recent memory that still hurt us and hold us back, God, for those who deal with repetitive sin here this morning, whatever that may be, how many of them they may be, Lord, let these things not separate us from you. Lord, for those who feel the pain, the sting of relational failure, a relational abandonment of, of whatever it be, I pray as well, Lord Jesus, that you would heal. And as Paul left space at the end for reconciliation, Lord, I pray, God, that there may be some reconciliation as well, according to your will. But whatever happens, whatever outcomes there are, Lord, let the cry of each of our hearts be, Jesus, you are worth it. Every bump, every bruise, every scar, every failure, every success, everything that we go through, Jesus, you are worth it. And I give these things to you. Sometimes with shaking hands, sometimes with steady hands. Sometimes on my knees, sometimes running towards you. Sometimes crawling. Jesus, you are worth everything. And because of that, I give you everything. In Jesus' name, amen.